The story that we begin with really begins on a, on a very lonely mountain early in the morning. And across some landscape that is literally unknown to us, we know a certain region. I, I imagine early morning dew on the ground and not a whole lot in the terms of like green vegetation, but there was some rough and tangled and covered in thickets. And there's no path, there was no road. This wasn't a, a special mountain before now. And, and up the side of this mountain, however big or however small it was, it was one that, that an old man saw in the distance. And when he saw it, he knew that's the one. His heart dropped. He knew that was the one, and he walked up that mountain, and there was only the sound of wind howling through the air, maybe a bird or two, and footsteps, his footsteps, and the footsteps of his son. And in a few moments, there was this event that he saw coming only by a few days, but couldn't have imagined in his wildest nightmares. Where he laid that son of his on an altar of stones, and, and there was wood there, and his hand was raised, and the knife was out, and then all of a sudden a voice came, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on that boy. Don't touch him. Because you believed me, because you did not withhold your only son, I've provided another, he says. And, and there's the beginning of this story. Of course, it's caught partway through because the, the, the boy was a promise. The boy was... The, the promise that was, was given to Abram back when he was called Abram that, that there would be a son that would be given to him in spite of his old age, in spite of the fact that his wife couldn't have children and, and that that would make him the father of many nations. And then eventually, you know, came this moment where God asked him to lay Isaac on the altar and in the most unthinkable, gut-wrenching kind of request, what kind of God would toy with someone like that, it seems? What kind of God would ask for something like this? And, and you know, it churns your stomach and it, it, it makes us recoil at the request. But God knew that this would be a moment when Isaac would be offered to God in spite of his value, in spite of the promise and that Abram, Abraham would believe God that somehow there would be a way through this. And he didn't know what it was. But later, the author of Hebrews would tell us that, that Abraham had figured in his mind that God could raise men from the dead. And that even if the, the most horrible, unimaginable tragedy would happen at his own hand, for his own son, the one that he loved, even if the unthinkable would happen, that God would still fulfill his promise to him and that somehow Isaac would be alive again. Now, one of the things about Abraham and his, his faith is that it's, uh, it's, it's unique in that, in that he didn't have much to go on before. You know, Abraham was, was even though considered the father of the of the. Jewish people, he, he, he wasn't himself. I mean, he, he, he was just a guy. He was the beginning. So there was no history there other than God encountering him the way that he did. And, and, and there was no, as far as we know, there was no example that he had to go on to believe that God would raise his son from the dead. It's not like there was a history of resurrection or a book you could read where that had happened before. It wasn't like that at all. All he had was the voice of God telling him, Abram, I want you to go to a place. I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to give you a son. There will be more than the, the, the stars that you could ever count in the sky. And Abraham just believed God. That's it. That's, the, that's his story. And based on that, up on a mountain, 
He lifted his hand with a knife ready to be plunged into the flesh of his own son, believing that God would do something, even if it was to raise Isaac from the dead. We'll come back to Abraham in a minute, but, but if you look at the beginning of the book of Romans, where we'll be spending some time over the next number of weeks, the very beginning of it reads like this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and through the spirit of the holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who were called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now that's a whale of an introduction. We don't really, um, we don't talk like that in our letters and our communications. It's easy for us to, to miss the significance of what's being said here because what, we can communicate to each other anytime we want in almost any way we want. We never really think that much about the intros to our conversations with people. You know, if, if Paul could just do a, send a group text to all the believers in Rome, it would be different, you know? He would probably say like, hey, Romans, sup dogs, you know, and, like, and just go on with this, did you know that? And there, there it would go, right? But here... As Paul writes this letter, which is kept in a totally different way than anything that you and I have ever experienced in any communication with people in our time, everything is given such great care and attention, and he is introducing who he is, authenticated by the call of God on his life as an apostle to make known the gospel to the Gentiles. And in there is hidden something that is so important, and it's actually a theme in the book of Romans, that I think actually gets missed a lot of times because the, the book of Romans is so deep and it has so much great doctrine and there's so much intricate theology that's unfolded for us. It's easy to miss a thread that is woven throughout and that's the thread where we'll spend our time over the next few weeks. And that is right here in the, in the fourth verse. Through the spirit of holiness, Jesus was appointed or revealed or held out, confirmed, as the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. By his resurrection from the dead. We're going to talk about the, the resurrection of Jesus over the next number of weeks. And I had a very uh, well thought out and, and um, uh, I just really appreciated a thoughtful note that I got this week uh, asking about this, and it was actually in relation to, um, you know, a song that we had sung recently celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and it was connected to, you know, a season of Lent that we're coming into, and, and uh, really, really, a, a, a really good thought um, about, you know, the moving through the time period where we anticipate the sacrifice that Jesus made and the laying down of his life and his, his death and his burial uh, and, and then, of course, we, we look forward to celebrating his resurrection on Easter Sunday, six weeks from now. And so, you know, are we jumping ahead by, uh, by, by celebrating that now or by walking through uh, a resurrection theme six weeks before? And, you know, if, if for those of you who are, who are interested in, in, and maybe even uh, find a way to, to, uh, to relate with the Lord through an observance of Lent, you know, one of the interesting things about that is that it's 40 days, as you probably know, that's set aside in preparation for that time of, of celebration. But if you count back the, uh, the, from where Lent begins, it's actually more than 40 days. And the reason for that is because Sundays don't count in the 40 days of Lent. And the reason for that is because when the people of God get together, they always celebrate the resurrection. There is nothing else for us to talk about without the resurrection. We have no story. We have no purpose. There's no song that we could ever sing with any sense that it's true at all if it weren't for the fact of the that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so we are a church literally because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And so for that reason, even in the celebration, which is timed out very uh, carefully with a lot of wisdom to prepare, not to jump us ahead too far to all the celebration, but to appreciate the walk that was walked all the way to the cross and eventually to the grave, even as we celebrate that, every time we gather, the only reason we have to gather is because Jesus has risen from the dead. And so that's why it doesn't count in Lent. So I feel like that's okay for me to share. In 1789, there was an argument between James Madison and Roger Sherman. I'm grateful that I just said it that way because in my head I keep thinking Richard Sherman and that's a totally different individual. <laughs> but James Madison and Roger Sherman had a, had a disagreement and ended up being a fierce debate as the Declaration of Independence had already been Declared and the Constitution had already been ratified, and James Madison, who had written that uh, together with some other fellows, uh, had had uh, become aware of the fact that there there are certain uh, practical applications of the fact that uh, all men being created equal have these inalienable rights, which are given to us not by a government or a king, but by our Creator. And then, there, and then after that, the Constitution was formed as a way of saying, here's the structure of our government. Here's how it should work. Here's, here's what it should look like based on that truth. But there were certain practicalities to living life in a country that was structured that way based on that truth that still had yet to be articulated. And so James Madison wanted to include those things in the Constitution and thus the debate. Because Roger Sherman... Uh, he had a very important insight, recognizing that, no, these should be addendums or amendments to the Constitution for two very important reasons. One was because the Congress doesn't have a right to modify the Constitution. The other was because the practical applications of this train of thought originating with the creation of humankind by a creator, giving them rights because they're human, and now practically living in a culture based on that, these practical applications need to be held out separate for the sake of being highlighted. This is how you live. This is what life looks like because we have this structure based on the rights that God gives us as our creator. And so that's how we get the Bill of Rights. And so in the Bill of Rights, you know, you have all kinds of things that we appreciate and live in every day, practically speaking. You know, our freedom of, of speech and the freedom of the press and the right to bear arms and uh, the right not to have to be forced into quartering soldiers. And, you know, some are obviously more applicable than others. But the, the point is, is that when you read through the Bill of Rights, then what you see is, is really kind of a, a description of the practical application of what it is to live as a free person with rights given to us by God. In Romans... Paul's theme of the resurrection, which is woven throughout at least the first 10 chapters as a basis for all that he's saying, the theme of the resurrection is like the Bill of Rights for us in the book of Romans. Because it gives us a, a, an understanding of the practical application of this great gospel achieved for us by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who went to the cross for our sins, went to the grave because it was our death, but then was raised to life again in power and glory. And therefore, what does life look like for all of his followers? And so Romans lays that out for us through this theme. And that's one of the reasons why I want to take this time over the next number of weeks to talk about it. Because every year there's, there's this great celebration that we have at Easter Sunday when we celebrate that Jesus is risen from the dead. And then before you know it, we move on. And I, I struggle sometimes, I worry sometimes that if I don't pay close attention to understand what does that mean today? For me, as a practical matter of living life today, then we celebrate a historical event that happened thousands of years ago and miss that it is meant to give us a daily life of encounter with God and of power and of his presence and of promise. And there's so much that's there for us. And so just like I would encourage any of us to understand the Bill of Rights, that we need to understand what it is that we've been given by virtue of that, that declaration. 
We need to understand what it is that we've been given by virtue of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And here's the beautiful thing, is that the, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is your bill of rights. But more than that, it's your blueprint for life. The resurrection of Jesus is your blueprint for life. This is what God is up to in your life. The resurrection is your bill of rights and your blueprint for life. And so we're going through this series, Resurrection Today. And we'll trace through what Paul has to say about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead in the book of Romans. When I was in eighth grade, I had this moment that I was pretty sure I ruined my whole life. And it's kind of a funny moment because out of all the things that I did growing up, this was not the most ruinous, trust me. <laughs> but uh, there's a particular reason why I thought it might be. It was the last day of school. And, uh, and I love the last day of school. I love the last day of anything, really. Um, it's another story, but it was the last day of school, and... And you know how like on the last day of camp or the last day of a retreat, if you remember being a part of those things, or the last day of vacation, there's a certain buzz in the air, right? If you've ever been on a youth trip or a camp or something, you know that on the last day, if you're a youth leader, that's the day you really, really have to watch out for all of the crazy things that will happen. Because for whatever reason, it's the last day and everyone goes nuts was the last day of school, and there was that buzz in the air. And I, I went to my history class, and, uh, and the history class was led, uh, taught by a teacher, Mr. Stover. Mr. Stover was about 854 years old. <laughs> and, and, he, and, and, and for most of his life, he was an extremely cranky, grumpy man. I say most of his life because I assume that when he was first born, everything was fine. But probably within about 10 or 15 minutes, he turned cranky, and that's the way he was. Very, very cranky man. And it was a difficult to make it through this class because he was hard on everything. He was a total grump all the time and, uh, and, and just was kind of like, you know, get away from me, you, you know, you stupid kids. I really don't even like you, whatever. He's biding his time or whatever. It's kind of how it felt. But on the last day of school, I went into history, history class, and some students had brought some, some donuts to class because we were celebrating the last day of school. And for whatever reason, Mr. Stover was okay. In fact, actually, he was gone because he was smoking outside. But, um, <laughs> but as he came back in to class, uh, he, he came back in the door. And, and I, don't, I don't remember the details of why this happened, what possessed me to do such a thing, but I think some friends had encouraged me a little bit, and I, I, had, I had gotten a jelly donut in my hand, and when Mr. Stover came in the door, I said, thank you for a great year, Mr. Stover, and I reached out to shake his hand, and I squished the jelly donut right in his hand. I know, I know, gasp. The crowd's, <gasps> how could you? Well, Mr. Stover did not appreciate that it was a goofy kid doing a goofy practical joke. He grabbed my ear, and he marched me down to the principal's office. And as he handed my ear over to the assistant principal, <laughs> he said to me, this will be on your permanent record. <laughs> and that was a phrase I had never really heard or at least engaged with that much before. And my little mind went crazy. And I thought, my permanent record? <laughs> There's a permanent record, <laughs> and now all of the things that I had ever done, or all of a sudden I'm, I'm filtering through, could those have made it on my permanent record? I don't know. This is the first time I ever heard of a permanent record. But there they, I don't know what happened next. I just blacked out or something. I'm not sure. But, but the permanent record, and I, I thought in my mind, like from now on, like when I go to class next year, you know, they're going to be looking, oh, yeah, that guy, right? When someday down there, I'll be at a bank applying for a loan, and they'll be like, you're the jelly donut squish guy, you know, or I'll know, I won't be able to get a job, and no one's going to marry me, and all just crazy things that you think. We never think about a, 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 a permanent record until we realize it's ruined. And I know that it's just such a stupid and silly example, but... But one of the messages at the beginning of the book of Romans is that before we even realize there's a record, we have so utterly, completely blown it that our position 
is as absolutely hopeless and wrecked as it ever could be. And there is no getting out of it. There is no appeal process. And the consequences are deadly and eternal. And it doesn't matter how you try to fix yourself or pretend that that didn't happen or pretend that the entire record doesn't exist. It is attached to you, it is affixed to you, it has become you, and you are not getting away from it. That's the first couple chapters of the book of Romans. In sin, we are as dead as dead can be. We are absolutely, fully, completely dead meat. And it has become for us the moment that we experience that sinful life, From that point forward, it becomes for us not just stuff we do against God, but it becomes who we are. Have you heard this when when maybe a famous person is is trying to work up their their, uh, publicist's uh, apology, and they they say, I know I said that, but I just want you to know that's not what? That's not who I am. We want to separate that because we think that maybe maybe people will realize that, yeah, that came out of my mouth, but that's different than who I am. But what Romans teaches us in those first three chapters is that, oh yes, it's who you are. Oh yes. From the very first time that you disobeyed, that you defied, that you violated God's law. And not just his law, but his character, his nature. Because remember what Jesus said, if you just hold hatred in your heart, you're guilty of murder. Why? Because you want to. So there's no escaping it. And it's so attached, so affixed, so us. It's terrifying. And I would encourage you, even though I know it's challenging to read, but I would encourage you to read through those first three chapters in Romans, and you'll see for yourself exactly what I mean, if you haven't already. And it, it's, it's capped off with these words in Romans chapter 3. There is no one right, just not even one. There is no one who understands. Listen to this. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It's not the only thing that he says about this, but it's a good place to kind of see how it all kind of comes together in this heavy pronouncement that this is more than your permanent record. It's your very identity. And it's mine too, apart from Jesus. And one of the things that we realize when we read this is that we are enemies of God. In our sin, we are adversaries of God in our sin. We're not uh, those who just sort of messed up, but we're, we're actually opposed to God in our sin. We're ruined, we're lost. And there's no hope of us working our way out of it. And there's no appeal process, there's no even access for appeal on our own. But there's this radical question that shows up in chapter 4. And it doesn't show up in the form of a question, but in the form of a quote from King David. A radical question. What if, even though those sins happened, what if they never happened? What if you could look at your ruined permanent record and realize it could be dealt with. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. What if it never happened? Getting back to Abraham, in chapter 4, verse 3, The word says that Abraham believed God. That's what happened in that moment. And back when he believed God for the promise to start with, he believed God. And verse 3 says, and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
It was credited to him as righteousness. If Abraham had the ability to look into his account with God at that moment when he believed God, he would be shocked to see that anything and everything that I have done against this God that I'm getting to know has now been wiped out, and instead of that massive debt, my account is full of righteousness. There must be some mistake. Can you imagine if your account, you know that you have blown through your, your entire limit on your credit card and you haven't looked at it for weeks and weeks and weeks because you know that it's going to be so miserable to see and then you just work up the nerve at one moment to look at it and not only is that entire amount of debt wiped out, but now there's an incredible surplus where you're actually wealthy. Can you imagine? And that times a million as it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, what was it that he believed? In chapter 4, verse 17, he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things into being that were not. That's what Abraham believed. That God was the kind of God that could call things into existence that don't exist. Wealth where there is none. Righteousness where there is none. A living son where there was about to be none. A son at all where there could never have been. Abraham believed that God could call things into existence that were not. He does not believe in a God who calls things that do exist as if they did not. That's important. God does not call our sin as though it doesn't exist. He does not tell us there is no sin. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. So it is as if, it is just like, as if it never happened. But we know it did, and we know he's the kind of God who calls righteousness where there was none. And Abraham believed that God would do that. And in that, it was credited to him as righteousness. Let me read for you more from verse 18 through 22. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so your offspring shall be. And without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. He was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened in his faith and he gave glory to God and he became fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. There's the explanation. This is why. But then there's a bombshell. And this is why we're here today. The next verse is an absolute bombshell that every one of us should pay very close attention to. Verse 23 and 24. The words it was credited to him were not written for him alone, but also for us. You read that story, and you realize that story wasn't just for him, but it was for all of us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. I mean, can you, can you, can you take it in? If you just... If we just stop and, and let the, the magnitude of what was just said just wash over us, that somehow God had the kind of grace towards Abraham that in his believing that God could do something like raising someone from the dead, it would be credited to him as righteousness. And then he's saying, and that belief, that credit was not just for him, it was for all of us because Jesus really was raised from the dead and all of us who put our faith in him that he was risen from the dead are now credited with his righteousness as well. And all of a sudden that permanent record is gone. And in its place is actually a record of righteousness. And I don't understand how to, how to, how to 
come up with that? I mean, how does he come up with righteous things that I've done, which I haven't done? I don't know. All I can say is Jesus does it. And God is all about bringing things into being as that didn't even exist before. And so he's credited my account and your account, if you're a believer in Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead, he has credited your account with the righteousness of Jesus. And that comes to us through knowing and believing and building our life upon the truth that God raised him from the dead. Amen? It, he goes on and explains a little bit more. Actually, he explains a lot more. It's Romans, but... He was delivered over to death. Actually, you know what? Would you read this with me? He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. You know what we get? You know the, the, the bill of rights that comes to us through the power of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead here on week one? Peace with God. And when you start to think about what it was that stood between us, the permanent record, the violations, the trespass, the hatred, the enmity, the adversary, the enemy that we were against him. And that permanent record, forgiven, covered, and replaced with a record of the righteousness of Jesus. And because of that, we have peace with God. Hallelujah. We have access to God. We have standing with God. He is once again our Father to whom we can run and spend time and enjoy and live in and thrive in and flourish in because we are right with God. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that God raised him from the dead, having gone to the cross for your sins, if that's you, you are standing right with God. Are there things he wants to adjust in your life? Oh yeah, me too, lots. But it's not because we're not in right standing because Jesus took care of that and that's the gospel. Amen? Amen. So here's a question. Bring it into the practical as we wrap it up. Why does God seem so far away a lot? Why does he seem so far away? We feel that, don't we? Maybe not always. Maybe we feel really close to him a lot, especially when we're in the one another's company, especially when we're in times of deep and beautiful worship or, or maybe a great time in the word or just a whole season of your life where you just feel like God is moving and talking to you and you're learning and growing so much. But probably everyone knows what it's like to feel like God's far away. Well, why? You know, for some... He feels so far away they've decided he doesn't even exist. And that's a little trick that we do. We're not wired that way. We're wired to know that he exists. All of creation is wired to know that he exists. But there's a little trick that we do to just decide that he doesn't. Because we don't know how to deal with the fact that he seems so far away. Because if he does exist, then why is this feeling here? Why is this struggle here? Why aren't these questions answered? Why do I feel the way I do? Why do I do the things I do? And all of the struggle of just the daily practical life things weigh us down to the point where we say like, okay, if he exists, then maybe he's not good. Or maybe if he's good, maybe I'm not good enough. And that's one of the things that I hear most of all, even in groups of believers. It's not so much that people tell me like, I don't believe in God. There's actually not that many people who do. And it's not that people necessarily believe that he's not good. We might wrestle with that from time to time. There's, there's struggle there sometimes. But a lot of times people believe that I must just not be good. 
I must just not be in his favor. There's a problem. And, and, and I don't have access to him. And we, we start to look at other people's relationship with God. And we think, well, if that person would pray for me, then God would move. Pastor, will you pray for me? Elders, will you pray for me? And that's good. That's biblical to say, elders, come pray with me. But it's not because God's not listening to you. It's not because they stand right with God and you don't. If you stand in his son, that his son was raised from the dead, you are in right standing with God. So he calls us together to pray with one another, not because someone else has better standing with God than you do, but because gathering together, we remind each other, we are all in the process of being raised from the dead. And everything that we have, we stand on in Jesus, who's already done it. The gospel, peace with God, made right with God. How right are we made with God through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? Could you be made more right with God any more than what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection from the dead? Have you ever admired someone's relationship with God? Have you ever been jealous for someone else's relationship with God? Have you ever looked at someone else and thought that they were deep, they were close with God, and so you count yourself out? Let me tell you, it's not because they are more right with God than you are. It's because they enjoy being right with God more than you are. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Do you hear the the enjoyment? Do you hear that enjoyment that says, I get to be right with God because of Jesus? It's the boast of my life. It's the rock that I stand on. It's my bill of rights. It's the blueprint for my life. And when we say, God, teach me to enjoy, to walk in, to accept, to believe that you've done this for me and I have right standing with you, that's when our deep and personal relationship with God takes off. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is your bill of rights and the blueprint for your life. It all starts with believing and enjoying this, peace with God because of Jesus. Peace with God only through Jesus. And what I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, fellow believers, is that you are living a resurrection story. Jesus is resurrecting the life that he originally intended through you in your life, and that's what we're going to continue to walk through over the next number of weeks. And for those of you who have never just put your faith in him, who have never said, yes, I believe that. I don't understand it but I know that that's true and I, I, I've never done anything with it, but, but I believe it's true. Then can I just implore you now? Can I encourage you now, my friend? This is what you're made for. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead changes everything. And he has given you a bill of rights that you wouldn't believe until you get to know him. And he has a blueprint for your life that all starts at that one moment where you say, okay, okay, I surrender. I'm not going to try to live my own life in my own power from now on. I cannot outrun my permanent record. But Jesus, you went to the cross for me. You took my sins there. I believe that's why you did that. And I believe that God raised you from the dead. Jesus Christ, Son of God, raised me from the dead too. And you know what? He will. He will.